This program is made possible by the loyal financial support of the friends and partners of Family Policy Institute. Good evening and welcome to Watchmen on the Wall. Thank you for joining us tonight. We at the opening of the 20th Parliament of South Africa and we are ready here waiting for the uh, President's State of the Nation address. I'm here with my co-host Michelle Links. Welcome Michelle, great to be with you again. Good to be here Errol. Now, uh, Michelle, uh, with all the things happening in South Africa, the lights going off, the corruption, the fight between the EFF and the ANC, what are you expecting from the president tonight? Well, Errol, the South Africa is low in spirit. They're feeling hopeless. They're feeling despondent. They're feeling like the president's not doing what he promised to do. So this evening speech, I hope that it's going to lift the spirit of South Africa, that people are going to feel that there's hope again in this country. South Africa is such a blessed country, a rich country. So we pray and we hope that tonight's speech is going to give hope to this nation. Yeah, I can. I, I say amen to that. But as Christians, we always have hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Obviously, not in government, not in institutions. But we are hoping for something positive, for something that the president is going to say that is going to give people hope, and you know, we're going to overcome the corruption and the unemployment and all the energy crisis and all the things that we're facing here. But you were talking about uh, unity, Michelle. But don't you think that unity begins in the churches, that church has to lead by example there and, and the nation will follow? Yes, I believe that it starts from the top down. You know, a unified, when there's unity, God shall command his blessing. Right. And a divided kingdom cannot stand. So when we see unity in government, it comes from the top down. It's, it's governmental. So I believe that there's unity in the church. Yes, it can flow into government. But I believe that when we work together as one, God will make this country a prosperous, a healthy nation. You know, Errol, so I believe in the unity factor, definitely. Absolutely. And, and we're going to ask... Christians to pray yes. you know we, there, there is a lot of things to be concerned about we cannot ignore that but the power of prayer is so incredible that Christians in this country can pray for the president pray for our parliament uh, can pray for all this all the challenges we face and God um, can make the difference in this nation yeah. but uh, we're looking forward to the president's speech tonight we we're hoping something positive is going to be said that is going to give people hope as Michelle said so go with us
We want to come in here just to explain what is happening. What you've just seen is the pomp and pageantry of the opening of Parliament that usually lends a lot of dignity to the somber and wonderful event. But that's where the dignified uh, part of the opening of Parliament ended. Now, Michelle, you were with me at the opening of Parliament, anchoring the show, and uh, it's, we were sitting in the media uh, section. Uh, yes. There was a lot of mirth, there was a lot of laughter, because the first thing that happened was uh, the cell phone jamming, uh, all the MPs screaming for it to be unjammed. The next thing, there wasn't water in the house, so they were calling for water. When the president got up to start speaking, uh, there were sound issues and people were laughing. It was, it was quite funny, yeah. the chaos. But then later on, it became disturbing. In the beginning, everybody was laughing. In the media room, everybody thought it was a joke. But afterwards, it actually became quite embarrassing and it was shocking to see what was happening with this long-awaited State of the Nation address to see how it unfolded. Yeah. And it was shocking to see the state of our nation. Yes, absolutely. It was. It was more about the state of the nation yes. than a state of a nation address. Yeah. Because were you surprised by the level of anger and animosity between the, the, the various members of parliament? Lots of anger, lots of, you know, wanting to actually make the other party look bad. Instead of working together and focusing on one goal, on one mission, taking the country forward. That actually, it was just a regression instead of a progression. Yeah, I must agree. That's exactly what I saw as well. But what we want to say to our viewers out there, you, you've just watched uh, the pomp and pageantry. The next thing you're going to see, and we need to explain this because things happen so fast and so disjointed. You had the media running around all over the place uh, ourselves as well and started the raining, and which added to the chaos. So the next thing you're going to see is... Uh, 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 the chaos that ensued in the National Assembly building, uh, the uh, calls for the unjamming of the cell phones, the water, the this, and then of course the EFF standing up and doing what they promised to do, That's and that is demand when Jacob Zuma, the president, is going to pay back the money that was used for Inkandla. And then of course uh, the presiding officer, the speaker, uh, ordered security in. Security were dressed like waiters, yeah. <laughs> white shirts and black, black bands. And uh, obviously they were violently ejected from the National Assembly. So you will see this next. And then uh, we managed to get an interview with the spokesperson of the EFF following all the chaos. Watch this. In terms of Rule 141, the joint rules of the Parliament says, joint sittings are open to the public, including the media. The media cannot do its work as long as the signal to do what they need to do is blocked. This has not happened in 20 years in Parliament. We were informed, Honourable Speaker, by some senior members of the ruling party that they are not aware of this, that the officials of Parliament are not aware of this. I'm under the impression, maybe, that the executive may have something to do with this. This is the, this is the highest legislative body in this country. In terms of the Constitution, ma'am, we cannot proceed unless we are open, an open society, and in terms of the media as well. Honourable members, I'm happy to report that, uh, according to the Secretary's report, the issue of the scrambling has been unscrambled. <laughs> Secondly, the water is coming. The year 2015 marks 60 years of a historic moment in our history when South Africans from all walks of life adopted the Freedom Charter in 1955 and uh, clipped Madam up Soweto. Madam they Speaker. declared, amongst others, that Madam South Speaker, Africa belongs to all who live of, in it, a question of privilege. black and white, and that no government can just Madam claim Speaker, authority I rise in terms of unless the rule it is based the on the will of all Honorable the people. Honorable President, I'm sorry to interrupt your speech. Uh, if the President would not mind just taking a seat so we can listen Thank to you. this Honorable Member's point of order. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise in terms of uh, Rule 14C of the Joint Rules of Parliament 6th edition, the Parliament of the Republic of South Africa. 
on a question of privilege. May I proceed? May we uh, ask the president as to when he is going to pay the money in terms of what the public protector has said? That's the uh, question of privilege would like to... And accordingly, since he has not been answering question, we hope today he shall answer that question. I thank you. I would like to remind you, honorable member, that a point of order must relate to a point of procedure concerning the current proceedings. As you know, today's sitting is convened for a specific purpose. That purpose is for the president to deliver his annual address to parliament. Members will have an opportunity to debate and respond to the address by the president at the sittings scheduled for next week, including raising any related matters. So this is not a question session. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Malema, I don't think you are going to raise anything that is not covered by what I have said. You are making a mistake because you are reading my mind. Honorable Malema. Allow me to speak. Honorable Malema. Please, Speaker, can I speak? Because on what? On Honorable. the same points that the members are raising. You are not doing me. You are not doing me any favor, and none of these people who are howling are doing me any favor. It is within my right to speak as a member of this house and remind you that it is incorrect of you to want to suggest that when the president speaks, you suspend the rules. The rules are not suspended, and the rules must apply even when the president speaks. And you have not answered the question of Dr. Vauda. Stop treating people as a group. Treat them as individual members of this house and respond to them as individual members. The individual member that spoke, you explain, he sat down. The other one spoke, you explain, he sat down. When Vauda's turn comes, you say, I've responded to you and you are insisting and he was speaking for the first time. Stop treating people as a group. We're speaking as individual members. We want the president to answer a simple question. When is he paying the money as directed by the public protector? That's all we're Honorable asking. Honorable Malema, you are not raising anything new. And what you are saying is still the same thing I've responded to, I've explained, and I've patiently been asking you, honorable members, to allow this house to proceed with the business of the day. And the business of the day is that the president will deliver the state of the nation address. And I am not allowing any other member to raise any other point of order. I am not allowing you, honorable members, because I have explained to you that you are actually abusing. Which rule are you using, honorable my honorable speaker? speaker? Which honorable rule are you using to deny members to raise a point of order? They are protected I, by the I rules. Am now you cannot be emotional about honorable it. Honorable Point Julius, us the rule which gives you powers Julius, to deny us point of order. Honorable Malema, I now have to ask that you leave the chamber. Honorable Speaker. Honorable I'm members, still asking a question. Honorable members of I'll the EFF, I, I an have answer. ruled on the matter and I am now asking you to leave the chamber. On a point of order. Honor Honorable Speaker, Man speaker, speaker I am the member of this house. She's all la Latina, so la la la. Order. Will all honorable members stand and take their seats? Oh. Oh. The security forces must come in in terms of the powers and privileges act. Members of the NCOP, take your seats. Members of the NCOP, Honorable Jamin.
Zamini. Honorable Zamini. Take your seat. this chamber. It is a grave constitutional violation. It it we want to be here to get the state of the nation addressed, but we cannot violate this constitution. They have called the presidential protection unit to come and remove us inside the house. And that's why they couldn't answer the question whether those are security people or their police. But we've got it on good authority that that was the presidential protection unit. When we were scuffling with them, they asked us outside not to fight back because they are police. And fighting them back would mean fighting a law enforcement officer. That's how we came into an understanding and walked away. We have less than 10 kilometers infrastructure support is the man capital of the country. Instead of deploying police there to go and uh, funding has been do provided seek criminals for protect ordinary citizens, police have been mobilized to protect a man against the question. In the 2015 to guard a man to so that he is not asked a question. That must be a fundamental undermining of a democracy. But um, I think we witnessed uh, the degeneration uh, of, uh, of South Africa as we know it today. But people in Parliament could not engage in the whole district. We can't back down because we did nothing wrong. We can't back down because we sought to hold President Zuma out. We did that because you can't just say, I will meet you and address you and I will come later to answer questions. No, our fundamental remedy is to hear programs is to hold them accountable. Well, That's the remedy of Parliament. So, yes, indeed, we, we, will, we will stick to our cards. We also need so you, to fight. Parliament is not going to work until President Copper Trump cable and and No, Parliament sense. works. Parliament works. We, we don't even like the dramatic, the bossy and you know, the closing of the roads and all those things. Government Actually, Parliament works very well will every day. Parliament is not the state of the nation address. Parliament is not the joint seat. There's lots of Parliament work happening. The executive, the head of the executive is Jacob Zuma. And uh, but life does move on without him. Oh, and it will. Anniversary of the Thank you, sir. Okay. Our next interjection is just to explain to you what is happening, which, what just happened and what is happening next. So, uh, Michelle, we watched this from the media room uh, when the DA, very angry uh, DA parliamentary leader, Musi Maimani, stood up and asked the speaker to explain who the security was. Yeah. Now, apparently, the security had uh, firearms and uh, they're not allowed, the police is not allowed into the National Assembly building. And uh, so he asked this question repeatedly. And because the uh, presiding officers couldn't answer that question, Musi Maimani led the DA out, a walkout of the National Assembly. And what did you think about that while you were watching that? Gosh, that just went from one level to another level. You know, I thought, what is happening here? Chaos, complete chaos, you know, from the EFF to the DA and People actually want, came to see or came to hear the president's speech. So disruptive. Yeah, it's amazing you would say that because even through the president's speech and, and, and our viewers, while you're watching, the next thing you're going to see is what the DA walk out of the National Assembly building. And then we catch up with Helen Zeller, the, DA, the leader of the DA, and Musi Maimani. We get interviews with both of them, very angry, uh, very livid, um, you know, talking about what the chaos that just ensued in Parliament. So the next thing we're going to see is uh, Helen, uh, an interview with Helen Ziller and DA parliamentary leader Musi Maimani, clearly angry. But while we're interviewing them, we can hear President Zuma's speech in the background. He's still droning on. And the thing is, the media wasn't interested. I don't think anybody was interested in the speech while it was being made, except for the ANC members. Nobody was interested at all. Because most of the opposition benches had been cleared out by this time. The chaos that was happening outside, we caught up with that, and you can still hear President Zuma's speech. So watch this. We cannot simply allow for police to be allowed to enter this chamber. It is a grave 
constitutional violation. It admi it ad we want to be here to get the State of the Nation address, but we cannot violate this constitution of the people of this country by allowing the police in this chamber. We can't accept that. I'd like clarity on that matter, Adam Speaker. There is no way I could sit in here be able to pick out who is police and who is not police here. This evening is an indication of what Parliament is going to be like for the rest of this year. It's very simple. We can all respect the Constitution and the law and the rules of Parliament. This would never have happened if the President always came and answered questions when he is supposed to. But he doesn't, does he? He doesn't understand the Constitution because he says, I'm not a member of Parliament, why should I come? He comes because Parliament is here to hold him to account. It's also time that the Speaker learns something about the Constitution and the law. It's also crucial that the Speaker stops the security forces scrambling signals and entering the chamber, which is a complete breach of the separation of powers. And it is time that the EFF and all the other parties learn to respect the rules so that when the Speaker says you must leave, you get up and leave. If you don't leave, the orderlies may come and take you out, but the Speaker may not call the armed security forces into that chamber. It's a civilian chamber of elected public representatives. So who do you think is uh, to blame for the chaos here tonight? Well, there's a long chain of blame. It starts with a president who won't want to answer questions. It starts with a speaker who doesn't know the rules of parliament and certainly does not know the constitution of the country. And then it also ends with the freedom fighters, the economic freedom fighters, who will not listen to instructions of the speaker. So this is all a chain reaction. The DA is the only party that plays by the rules. And when the speaker brings in the security security forces and will not confirm this and answer questions on the subject, we get up and leave of our own accord. Mazilla, final question. Do you support the EFF's uh, call to the president to pay back the money? It's not the EFF's call to pay back the money. It's a ruling by the public protector. And the bottom line is that the president is not above the law. It's part of the constitution that he comes and answers questions in parliament. When the, pub, when the public protector says that you have to do something, you can only get it reviewed in a court of law. The president is not getting it reviewed in a court of law. He's just refusing to pay back the money. When the hawks start investigating the corruption in Nkandla, he tries to fire Ahmad Anwar Dramat. He tries to fire Anwar Dramat so that he can't investigate the corruption in Nkandla. That's what's going on in this country, and it is time that the voters wake up if they don't want to end up in a criminal state. Mm. Thank you, Mr. The State of the Nation address uh, descending into such chaos. Now, I see you, you and your members wearing black tonight. The first question, why are you wearing black? And secondly, why did you lead the DA members out of Parliament? Foreign to, to, tonight was a was a disaster for South Africa. We were black because we felt that South Africa has got very little to celebrate. We were black because we felt that we face a dire situation, and tonight it was confirmed. It was confirmed that actually the constitution of the republic means nothing to President Zuma. That in fact they will use military and the police to be able to come in on board. Why can a member carrying a gun enter the sacred space of parliament so as to disrupt opposition politics? We carry on at that level. What, what is the next thing? All for the protection of one person who is President Zuma. This is a crime against the constitution of the republic, but a huge, huge insult to those who died in fighting for nothing else but the defense of the constitution. And we're standing right in front of the bust of Nelson Mandela, our first democratically elected uh, president. Are you concerned for South Africa's democracy? I am without fail. Because if all our freedoms can be violated for the protection of one man, 
That means South Africa is regressing, not progressing. And I feel that's not something that President Nelson Mandela would stand for. In fact, under his government, he appeared before parliament. He arrived to answer questions. He held the constitution to be supreme. He accepted the ruling. What the FF did was wrong. But make no mistake, the use of military police in this place is also just as wrong. Now, this is just the opening of parliament, the State of the Nation address. The president is currently, as we're speaking, making the State of the Nation address. Half of parliament has walked out. What, what do you, what is your expectation for the rest of Parliament for the year 2015? I want to build a Parliament. I want a Parliament that works. What this happens cannot be accepted. I want a country that works. I want a country for our children. I want a country that works. But the only way societies work is if the rules are applied fairly and consistently. The moment rules are changed for, the, for one individual, we then face a grave danger. And that's why I rose on point 14K, which is there was a grave, grave violation of the rules and disturbance of the house today. Mr. Maimani, our final question is, with all of what is happening in South Africa, uh, the energy crisis, the corruption, uh, the unemployment, uh, the economy uh, stagnating, do you still have hope? for this nation. I have to. I have to love South Africa. I have to fight for it. I have to uphold it. And tonight's walkout really says I want to uphold the rules of this country and the constitution of this republic. I'll continue to fight for it. And if that's one thing I do for my life, it's a worthwhile cause to pursue. Because if I don't pursue that cause and say let the constitution be flouted, well, what is the sustainability of our democracy? Thank you, Mr. Maimani. Thank you. <laughs> I was saying the year 2015 marks 20, 60 years of a historic moment in our history when South Africans from all walks of life adopted the Freedom Charter in 1955 in Cape Town, Soweto. They declared, amongst other things, that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and that no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of all the people. Compatriots, our economy needs a major push forward. We would like to share with you our nine-point plan to ignite growth and create jobs. These are, one, resolving the energy challenge, two, revitalizing agriculture and the agro-processing value chain, three, advancing beneficiation or adding value to our mineral wealth, four, more effective implementation of a higher impact industrial policy action plan. Five, encouraging private sector investment. Six, moderating workplace conflict. Seven, unlocking the potential of SMMEs, cooperatives, township and rural enterprises. Eight, state reform of boosting the role of state-owned companies, ICT, infrastructure or broadband rollout, water, sanitation, and transport infrastructure, as well as nine, Operation Pakisa aimed <coughs> at growing the ocean economy and other sectors. Compatriots, the country is currently experiencing serious energy constraints, which are an impediment to economic growth and is a major inconvenience to everyone in the country. Overcoming the challenge is uppermost in our program. We are doing everything we can to resolve the energy challenge. We have developed a plan 
which involves which involves both short, medium term, and long term responses. The short and medium term plan involves improved maintenance of ESCOM power stations, enhancing the electricity generation capacity and managing the electricity demand. The long-term plan involves finalizing our long-term energy security master plan. As a priority, we are going to stabilize ESCOM's finances to enable the utility to manage the current period. In this regard, government will honor its commitment to give ESCOM around 23 billion rand in the next fiscal year. Compatriots, during this year, of the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Charter, land has become one of the most critical factors in achieving redress for the wrongs of the past. Last year, we reopened the second window of opportunity for the lodging of land claims. More than 36,000 land claims have been lodged nationally, and the cutoff date is 2019. We are also exploring the 50-50 policy framework, which proposes relative rights for people who live and work on farms. <laughs> 50 farming enterprises will be identified as pilot projects. In terms of our new proposed laws, a ceiling of land ownership will be set at a maximum of 12,000 hectares. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Foreign nationals will not be allowed to own land in South Africa. <laughs> but will be eligible for long-term lease. In this regard, the regulation of land holdings bill will be submitted to parliament this year. What you just saw was a brief uh, part of uh, President Zuma's State of the Nation address on uh, the 12th of February. We couldn't get uh, all of it in because of what happened and transpired, obviously, uh, outside Parliament, uh, inside Parliament, and around uh, just media running around, chaos, police, uh, ambulance, uh, uh, people bleeding, torn clothes, <laughs> all of it, it just all happened. Yeah. But... Uh, but what was amazing, Michelle, was after all of this chaos and everything that happened both inside and out, at the end of the speech, when the president ended his speech and, and, and parliament was dismissed, how the ANC members exited the National Assembly building in jubilant mood, dancing and singing struggle songs, even going around the bust of Nelson Mandela and doing a whole homage to him. And it, it jarred so much with what just happened before. As if nothing happened. As if nothing happened. So how do you move forward and forget what had just happened? Exactly. And exit in that way. Yeah. It just, um, it was crazy because even the international media, everybody was standing looking around like, what is happening here tonight? Because of, of just the different scenarios that unfolded uh, at the opening of parliament. And so... Uh, we were fortunate to track down uh, the, min the Minister of Home Affairs, Malusi Gigaba, who represents government. And we got a comment from him, 
uh, and we also, Taryn got hold of Zueli Mkizi, who was the Treasurer General of the ANC. He's not in government, he represents the a ANC. So we got a representative or spokesperson of government to give their view and from the ANC. And then finally, we speak to Reverend Kenneth Meshu, the president of the ACDP, and try to get his view, a kind of biblical view of what, is, what happened that night. So here we go. Mr. Gigaba, we saw on television in the media room what happened in Parliament tonight. What is your thoughts on, on what happened? It was a sad day for South Africa's 20-year-old democracy because this type of behaviour would not be expected of people who have taken an oath of office to serve the people of our country. When we get inside there, we are treated and regard ourselves as honourable members. But the disrespect for our constitution, the disrespect for the presiding officers for such an important institution of democracy, when all the three arms of the state are gathered together to listen to the state of the nation, was an indictment to all of us, and I think a very, very sad day for our democracy. It's something that we wish would not have happened. It's something we wish will not happen again. But nonetheless, I think it was very good for the parliamentary protection services to restore order in the House so that the State of the Nation address should proceed and the President addresses the nation. And I think it's good that the President persisted with the State of the Nation right until its conclusion. Do you think what happened tonight was planned by the EFF? Well, they had already said as, as, as early as last year that this was what they were planning to do. It would have been very, very tragic had they accomplished the objective of disrupting the State of the Nation address. I think a very clear message went out today that their behavior will not be tolerated. What I find most disheartening is for the Democratic Alliance, which professes selective support and respect for the Constitution, on the one hand to claim that they are, that they, they, they that, um, they support the constitution, but on the other hand, to, to support the fundamental trumping of the constitution by siding and sympathizing with hooligan behavior, such as the one that the EFF was trying to subject us to. It was well planned, well, and, and, and the, it was nearly well executed for the parliamentary protection services to step in and restore order. I think all South Africans should be grateful. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Gigaba. Well, firstly, I want to say that the President's speech focused on the issues that I wanted to hear about. The issue of power, uh, ESCOM, short term and long term, I think for us was very important. The issue of the focus on the economy, the trends, employment and the growth that the President spoke about was very important. The performance of various sectors was also important, automotive sector, and uh, the issue of the infrastructure rollout of uh, auto, uh, what you call uh, um, uh, broadband, all of these for us are very, very important. I think that the president's speech was focusing on issues South Africans wanted to hear about. Now, I don't believe that it is fair for any member of parliament to try and uh, obstruct a possibility of such an address being made by the president to the nation. I think all members have got a right to ask, ask questions, to receive answers from the executive. Indeed, the president is accountable because the dates have been given as to when this whole, uh, the, these questions will be dealt with. I think there should have been a sense of common decency of allowing the president to speak. And then uh, on the right day, then they can take you know, all the questions deal with the issues because I don't believe that you know there's a question you can be stopped from asking. But I think in this case it was premeditated. It was announced many weeks before. Now once there's 
disruption in parliament, that is unconstitutional. The parliament must be protected, the constitution must be protected. You can't say because you've got a right you can stop parliament from operating. And I think that some members of parliament need to learn. You take an oath to protect the constitution and to abide by the constitution and protect parliament, you must do so. But if you cannot do so, then the law has to uh, you know, take its course. We cannot say that someone, uh, if, if the disruption gets to a point where the words, the instructions, the orders of the speaker are defied, then of course you have to scale it, escalate it to higher levels. It's respect that is needed and as far as I'm concerned I think there are some members who behave as though they are not ready to be members of parliament because at the end of the day everybody wanted to hear what the president has got to say. Let them talk about it, those who want to criticize it, those who want to agree with him, those who want to say, analyze it, whatever, but they must have that opportunity. But no selfish interest should be allowed. Reverend Kenneth Meshew, we're standing outside Parliament here just after the President's uh, State of the Nation well, address. Um, give us your view of what, firstly what happened in Parliament before the address, the chaos that ensued and also what you thought of what the President said tonight. What happened tonight was shocking. We are very sad that the international community is looking at us and wondering what kind of parliament we are. The mistake was made by the presiding officers last year. They should have nipped the whole thing in the bud. I spoke to some ANC officials last year and say you need to have standards and you need to have rules that you must enforce. And some of them said to me, no, they will outgrow what's happening. These new members, they will outgrow what they are doing. And I said, no, they are not going to outgrow it. They are going to get used to it. And indeed, we have been proven true. It is difficult for them now to bring order because they have allowed people to be disorderly from the beginning. We were very disappointed. Uh, some people I'm sure were hurt. They are going to go to court because the rules allow them to ask questions. I mean, they were, when it comes to asking questions, the rules do allow that to happen. But it's not the convention of parliament. They should have anticipated this and came to make sure that their rules were in place and they didn't do that. So we are very disappointed that the chaos that took place in Parliament today was seen by the whole world and by our country because in this place you should have leaders who should be leading by example. And we have failed the country, we have failed to lead by example. I'm very disappointed at that. This I highlights the importance of righteous people rising up. All the Christians out there who are saying we are disappointed, it is their God-given responsibility to rise up and fill this place because they understand what respect for authority is, what respect for rules are. They understand that, so they need to rise up rather than just criticize and condemn. Christians must wake up. Now about the speech tonight, the speech was uninspiring. Very disappointed with what the president did tonight. We are facing load shedding, load shedding every day. And the president did not say anything rather than we are planning. Every time he talks about he has plans, what are those plans? He does not elaborate. So ACDP is very disappointed with the speech tonight. It was very inspiring. I was even getting drowsy. I had to go outside so that I didn't fall asleep in front of the cameras because the speech tonight was boring. And uh, you've been in Parliament for 20 years now. You've seen 20 State of the Nation addresses. Have you seen anything close to this? This was the worst tonight. And uh, for me, it shows that the writings on the wall for the ruling party. It is time for the godly to rise up and ensure that dignity is restored to this house so that hope is given to the nation. The nation is hopeless tonight because of what happened. Thank you, Pastor Kenneth. Welcome back. Um, Michelle, um, Kenneth Meshew's uh, challenge to the church, I think, is timely that the church must wake up. We need Christians to get into parliament, uh, to obey the rules, to, to bring unity and purpose to our government again. 
Uh, you agree with what he said? Definitely. You know, with his unity, as I mentioned before, God commands his blessing. Mm. And just when Mordecai instructed Esther to go out to save the nation, he says, if you don't arise this time, someone else will be risen in your time. You know, and you've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I believe that we've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we need to rise up, you know, and, and just shake ourselves and do something. We cannot expect things to happen or the nation to become healthier if we don't do anything about it. And when you say we, you're talking about the church, the obviously. Church, definitely. Even in our intro at the beginning of the show, you were so prophetic when you spoke about unity. You talk about unity, moving the nation forward. And what we saw uh, in the past hour was anything but That's unity. But you're right, Michelle. It's a call from uh, Reverend Kenneth Meshew and from others um, that the church needs to rise up to the occasion now. Um, and this is what we uh, as Family Policy Institute is putting a call out to the church yes. that the nation needs to pray. We put a call to prayer out for the nation, specifically for South Africa, because both of us were there. Yeah. We both pastors, we both uh, and our crew all felt disturbed in our spirits when we left there. It took yes. me about three, four hours to fall asleep because of everything that I experienced. Now, what you see on television is one thing. But just being there. Experiencing in, it, in the having of, the whole experience and actually seeing I am a South African citizen and this is the state of our nation, of South Africa. It was sad. You know, we're raising our kids in this nation and this is what they have to live in. This is the type of country they need to live in or be under this type of government. We need to do something about yeah, it. And God has called us to be the hands and the feet. Mm. And we cannot sit back and just watch the country go down. This country has so much potential and Absolutely. it's time that we do something about it. Absolutely. And what we can do about it, because many people say, what can we do? Yeah. You know, we, we're not in government. The government doesn't listen to us when we speak. We have no voice. What you can do is pray, yes. because that's the one weapon that God gives us that nobody can take away from the Absolutely. church. And our weapons are not carnal, but mighty in God to, to pulling down strongholds. And so we're putting out the call to prayer on the 21st of March. It's Human Rights Day and uh, it's a Saturday. So we're asking Christians wherever they are. It doesn't have to be an organized event, but Christians can gather together all over this country yes. in home cell groups, in connect groups, in homes, private homes, in school halls, in church buildings. The churches can open their building from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. On, on Saturday, the 21st of March, and, and people can just come. They can either pray uh, at seven hours of united, fervent, heartfelt prayer for the nation of South Africa. And Michelle, I believe that God will hear our prayers. Absolutely. He will reach down from heaven, pour out His Spirit, and He will heal our land. That's God's yes. promise. doesn't matter what our government is doing and what people are saying. God tells us to pray. And he won't tell us to pray if, he, if he's not going to respond to that prayer or answer that prayer. Absolutely. So pray on the 21st of March, uh, f seven hours of fervent, united prayer for the nation of South Africa. That's our program for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Please visit our website at familypolicyinstitute.com and subscribe to my weekly newsletter. This is my primary method of communicating with you so please subscribe today. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, please write to us at info at familypolicyinstitute.com. We value your comments and your input. Remember, the latest edition of Joy magazine is available in retail stores right around the country. Please remember to get your copy. Thank you once again for joining us. God bless you and remember to keep standing.